Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome Rob, who will talk about how irrational is an irrational variety. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I should explain, I was explaining this a minute ago, I'm actually a last minute substitute. So we had originally scheduled um, an outside speaker to talk on PDE, but in the end, he wanted to defer his visit till next year so he could come in person. So Mark McLean asked whether I would uh, step in. And uh, given that this is the admitted student day, the visiting day, I thought it might make sense for me to uh, give a survey of some questions that I got involved in a few years ago, but since then they've been taken up by a number of students and postdocs here. So um, I should warn you, my own contributions such as they are aren't recent, but as I say, this will give me a chance to describe some of the work that people do in algebraic geometry here. And I, I do wanna make one kind of, I hope obvious caveat, which is that there's a lot of algebraic geom geometry done at Stony Brook. And this is, I'm, it's not my, I'm not trying to argue that this is the most interesting or the most, the, the, the majority of the stuff. It just happens to be what I know about. So that's what I'm gonna do. So let's see, whoops, let me see if I can get this. Okay. So I'm gonna talk about measures of irrationality for algebraic varieties. So the story is that, um, and I'm going to start by reminding you what is an irrational, irrational or irrational algebraic writing. And uh, by way of background, let me just say that you know when you teach, when you teach or take an introductory course in algebraic geometry, the basic foundational material kind of unwinds roughly the same way that it might in a differential geometry or topology course. You define the objects of interest, which in this case are uh, loci defined by polynomial equations. What are the interesting maps between them? So those would be things given by polynomials and so on. But then at a certain point in algebraic geometry, you hit this idea that's very classical, but doesn't really have, as far as I know, a, a clear counterpart in the other uh, great geometric theories, which are just maps and varieties that are defined only generically. And this is the whole idea of rational or birational geometry. And so um, what I'm gonna talk about today is a kind of a little piece of that. And so I want to start by uh, reminding what is a what is a rational and irrational algebraic variety. Okay, so let's start with um, a, x will be a smooth projective variety of dimension n over the complex numbers. So what does that mean? So x is a compact complex manifold of complex dimension n, and this business it should admit an embedding in projective space, which I don't want to worry about too much exactly what that means, but this is projective space is basically the simplest compactification of CN. And it's a place that's where compact man complex manifolds live and you can talk about loci defined by polynomial equations and so on. And it also has the nice advantage that anything that's any global object that's analytically defined turns out to be algebraically defined. Okay, so what, does a, what is a rational variety? So the definition is that one says that this, uh, this smooth projective manifold is rational if it has a Zariski open subset U and there's a Zariski open subset V of projective space so that U and V are isomorphic as open algebraic varieties. Okay, so here's a, here's a cartoon yeah, picture. Zariski open set is? As I'm about to define it, right. So here's the picture. So you start with your X and you take an analytic or algebraic subvariety. So you take some subobject z and you remove it. So x minus z, that's this is what a Zariski open set is. It's the complement of some analytic or algebraic subset. So you have some compact gadget, you remove something small and you get a u, you do the same thing in projective space and you get v. And so you have these two open these two open algebraic varieties, and the definition is that x is rational if there's this open this this x minus z that's isomorphic to the complement of some other analytic subvariety of projective space. Or to say the, the same thing another way is you're asking that x on the one hand and projective space on the other should be different compactifications of the same open variety. Another way of saying it is this, that um, in this world you look at maps that are given by rational or meromorphic functions. So um, what's equivalent to this is we asked that we should be able to find n different meromorphic or rational functions on X. So those are ratios of polynomials or analytic functions. 
And if we use these as coordinate functions, we get a map from X to CN or PN, it doesn't really matter. And then we get um, this gadget here should be generically bijective. So we have a map given by uh, meromorphic functions and we're asking it to be almost everywhere one-to-one -one and onto. Now, of course, if you have a, if your coordinate functions are meromorphic functions, meromorphic functions can have denominators and so they can have poles. So phi is actually not everywhere defined and that's why you write it with this dotted arrow. So it's, it's this is uh, again, and this is to, to those of us who have been trained as in sort of set theoretic math, it seems weird, but classically people didn't think twice about this. So you just allow functions to, to have poles and you ignore the poles. And so this gives an isomorphism between X minus the poles or the locus of indeterminacies and CN mi PN minus something. So this is, the, this is another way that we're kind of parametrizing. We're, if you were to go the other way, we're giving a rational parametrization of X. Now, more generally, um, there's a notion of birational equivalence in algebraic geometry, which is essentially just this. So two compact varieties are birationally equivalent if you can take a Zariski open subset of one as isomorphic to a Zariski open subset of the other. So you remove an analytic subset from one remove an analytic subset from the other and what's left, they're isomorphic. And this is the notion of birationally equivalent. And this, in this birational world, you deal with maps that are defined by meromorphic functions. And so what this notion of a rational variety is, it's they're saying that X is birationally isomorphic. In this birational world, it's isomorphic to the simplest algebraic variety there is, which is projective space, or if you like CN, it doesn't make any difference. So um, to be rational means that in this sort of funny uh, rational, by rational world, you're as simple as you can be. Okay, so let's look at some examples here. So what if you have a smooth uh, Riemann, compact Riemann surface? So that's a smooth algebraic variety of dimension one. Well, then the rational is the same thing as by, by regular isomorphism. So in this uh, in dimension one, X is rational if and only if it's isomorphic to the Riemann sphere, to P1. So you don't see by rational geometry in dimension one. But as soon as you hit dimension two or higher, things get more interesting. And the best way to kind of see what the, what the panorama is of, of rationality is to look at this uh, hypersurfaces in projective space. So I wanna look at uh, an n-dimensional hypersurface defined. So that's something defined by a single polynomial equation. And the issue is gonna be the whole point, the whole geometry is gonna be governed by what's the degree of that equation. So I wanna take one polynomial equation of degree D and I wanna look at a zero locus. And I wanna ask what, what the behavior of this zero locus looks like from this, uh, this point of view. Okay, well, what about degree two, quadrics? Well, quadrics are rational. And then we kind of, we, we, we learned this at an, at an easy early stage of life. And they're rational because you can do by um, stereographic projection. So here's a typical picture of a quadric. It's a sphere. And you pick a point on the sphere and you project. And so this gives you a map. Uh, this gives you a gen generally one-to-one -one map from the sphere minus this point onto a complementary plane. So. This is, a, this is your average basic example of a birational isomorphism. Of course, this, um, this point doesn't necessarily know where to go. And the situation is actually even worse than that because as usual, I'm drawing the real picture, but I'm thinking of working over the complex numbers. So if you're working over complex numbers, there'll be some whole lines that are contained in the quadrant. But in any event, uh, there's a few points where you don't know where to go. And, but, basically what's left over is if you take this point and remove this point and a little bit of other stuff, what you get is projector space minus some stuff. Okay, so you, that's good. You remove is just, you, you intersect it with its tangent hyperplane, right? And then... Yeah, that's what you would do, right. Okay, but now, um, now um, things get crazy. So there's this incredibly subtle range of degrees between three and the dimension plus one. And this is incredibly subtle and it's unknown in general. This is where all the act for these rationality questions, this is where all the action is. So um, this is a tremendously active area. Let me just tell you what the story is for cubics because that gives you a sense of how, how interesting it is. So if you take a cubic surface, uh, 
in, in P3, that's, it's been known since that that's rational. That's basically the story of the 27 lines on the cubic surface. So that's very classical. On the other hand, what happens if you go to three-dimensional cubic hypersurfaces in P4? So this is something that's only been figured out in my lifetime. I mean, that's not so sh short, but still, so this is about 50 years old. So cubic threefolds, any cubic actually is unirational. So what unirational means is that you can find um, a rational map from P3 to X, but it might not be one-to-one. -one. It might be two-to-one or three-to-one, something like that. And it's a classical theorem of Lerow that in dimension one, if you're in dimension two, if you're unirational, you're also rational. So it was a long-standing open problem. Is the same thing true in higher dimensions? And so this was a, finally established by Clemens and Griffiths in the late 60s or early 70s that this cubic threefold is not rational. But that's already um, you know, a, a serious theorem 50 years ago. That was one of the first applications of these. Griffith's intermediate Jacobians. Excuse me. Okay, uh, so that, unirational, excuse me, unirational means there's a finite to one map from P3 to X. Yes, right, right, right. So it, there's a there's a finite to one map, but it might not be one to one. If it were one to one, it would be rational, but it might be two to one or three to one. Generic, again, the point is ge generically finite to one, right? So it's generically, yeah, yeah. That, that's always right. So that's what the dotted line means. It's not everywhere defined and so on, right? Um, Right, but in low dimensions, that forces it to be rational. So if you have a Riemann surface, so you have a Riemann surface that's covered by P1, it has genus zero. But in higher dimensions, this was the counterexample. Okay, what but happens if when you get to- like to, If people like to think about there actually being uh, a well-defined point set map, there's always a variety in the middle, right? So there's a right, map right, that- right, right. Well, Let me, let me, yeah. I guess you're talking okay. about- right. what, what, what is the degree here for, for, to get a map I from P3 remember. to a cubic? I think it's probably two or three or something. I don't, I don't remember. Okay, what about dimension four? So those are always unirational. And um, there are some examples known, some families known where they're rational and everybody expects that the other ones are irrational. But as far as I know, there's not a single cubic fourfold that has been proven to be irrational. So that would be a big breakthrough. So it's, as Kalar said the other day, it's bewilderingly complicated. But now something funny happens. When you go into higher degree, the whole problem collapses. So um, continuing to look at these hypersurfaces, as soon as we get to degree at least n plus two, n is the dimension, x is never rational. So the whole problem collapses. And the reason is that there's a rather simple obstruction to rationality that kicks in at this point. And the obstruction is the presence of non-zero holomorphic forms, holomorphic tensors. So if you have any smooth complex, let's say algebraic projective variety, you can look at the space of holomorphic n forms on X. So those are differential forms of degree n, but they involve just dz. So it's something like dz1 wedge dz2 wedge dzn, where those are the local coordinates, local complex coordinates. And these form a finite dimensional vector space. And it, tur this is, uh, it turns out it's not hard to see that this vector space of holomorphic n forms is actually a birational invariant of a, of a, of a variety. So if you're rational, your space of holomorphic n forms is the same as the space of holomorphic n forms on projective space, but you, one calculates that projective space doesn't have any non-zero uh, holomorphic n forms. So if X is rational, it can't carry any non-zero holomorphic n forms for this relatively elementary reason. On the other hand, you can compute the space of holomorphic n forms on a hypersurface. And it turns out that they're isomorphic to homogeneous polynomials of degree D, that's the degree of the hypersurface minus dimension of uh, plus two. So as soon as the degree is at least N plus two, these hypersurfaces carry non-zero holomorphic tensors and so they can't be rational. So that the whole problem kind of disappears. Okay, so in this, in this low degree range, this is incredibly subtle. It's the it focus of a lot of it. zero there. Say it again. D equals n plus two, you have zero there. Yeah. It's so dimension, um, no, the degree zero. So there's the constant. These are the Calabi-Yau's. It's degree zero. So the constant form, they have, they, ah. it, 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 there's a non-zero polynomial of degree zero. It's like a K3 surface, right? Yeah. So, okay. So what happens, uh, right. So the, the whole question of whether or not things are rational disappears. <laughs> 
And but I'm gonna I'm I'm the sort of my focus today is not these subtle questions of when something's rational, but I want to sort of look at this sort of easy situation where you know it's irrational. And the question I want to ask is how irrational can you can you measure and control how irrational this x is? So uh, the idea is you don't uh, we're not going to worry about whether or not a variety is rational, but we're going to start with something whose irrationality we know and try to figure out how irrational it is. Okay, well, how should we measure this? Well, okay, let me start in dimension one. So, um, uh, so in dimension one, let's say we start with a compact Riemann surface, which an algebraic geometer calls a smooth projective curve. So you might imagine that the, the, you could look at the genus. So that would be the dimension of this space H10, but that's actually not what we wanna do. Uh, the idea in dimension one, this is a very classical idea, is that any Riemann surface can be expressed as a branch covering of the Riemann sphere, P1. And so we're gonna define its ganality. I don't like the word very much, but that's what it's called. Its ganality is the least degree of a branch covering. So we take a compact Riemann surface, we express it as a branch covering of P1, and we look at the least degree with which we can do that. Uh, another way to say the same thing is that any Riemann surface is the Riemann surface of some irreducible polynomial. So you think of a polynomial f of z w equals zero, expressing w as an algebraic function of z, and then the ganality of c is the smallest degree, smallest w degree of such a polynomial. Okay, um, so what does this tell us about a Riemann surface? So when the ganality is one, that means there's a degree one covering of the Riemann sphere. So the curve is it's isomorphic to, to, to the Riemann sphere. So C is just P1. What's ganality two? Well, the things of ganality two means it should be a double covering of P1. So that means it's the Riemann surface of a function of the form W squared equals H of Z, where H of Z is some polynomial in Z. And these have a name, they're called hyperelliptic curves. Now the genus of C, you can have hyperelliptic curves of any genus. The genus of C is essentially half the degree of H. But if you've played with curves, you'll know that all hyper, the, the thing that governs the geometry of a hyperelliptic curve is being hyperelliptic, not, doesn't all hyperelliptic curves independent of genus look more or less the same. So this is kind of our measure of the, of this is kind of the, the, the clear, the, certainly the right way to measure how irrational a Riemann surface is, you look at the least degree with which it's a branch covering. And then you can ask, well, take some famous, you know, take your favorite Riemann curves, Riemann surfaces and ask what's their, you know, what's their ganality. So for example, there's this old uh, observation of Nerther. This is Max Nerther, who was Emmy's dad. So he observed that if you take a curve of degree D in the plane, it turns out that its ganality is D minus one and the minimal degree um, maps to P1, you just project from a point. So it's stereographic projection again. Uh, if you're more ambitious, you can look at other curves. So there's Dan Abramovich in the early nineties. He's a student of Joe Harris. He studied that he looked at the ganality of these modular curves. So this is uh, the upper half plane mod modulo a subgroup of SL2 that parametrizes elliptic curves with some extra structure. And you can ask it's basically an N torsion um, subgroup of order N in the elliptic curve. And you can ask how the ganality of these things grow and it grows linearly in N. Okay, so that's the case, that's sort of clear. Now, so far I've been looking at smooth curves and I also wanna be able to talk about the ganality of a singular curve, but a singular curve has a unique smooth model. So that's what we'll, we'll take the ganality of a singular curve to be its smooth model. Okay, well, what happens, what happens if we try to go up? So the question now is what can we do in higher dimensions? So what are kind of some analogous, um, is some analogous definite, but some analogous measure of irrationality in higher dimensions? So actually there are a bunch of them, but I'm gonna really focus on two. So now let's say we have um, a smooth projective variety of dimension N and I wanna again find, so what's the sort of most natural um, what's the most natural generalization of the ganality is just to, to look at, again, the degree of branch coverings to the, to, in this case, projective space. So if you take an, any n-dimensional variety it can be expressed as a branch covering of projective space. And again, I want to look at the least degree with which I can do that. But now um, I want this to be a birational invariant. So I want to allow these kind of maps like stereo 
graphic projection from a sphere, I want to allow the map to not be everywhere defined and it might not be actually fi everywhere finite as Claude says, but I'm asking just the, the least degree of a, of a rational map, the least degree of a rational covering from X to PN. So when X is a smooth curve, this is exactly back to the ganality. So that's the most natural measure, but it's actually quite hard to control. And so there's a, another uh, invariant that's maybe a little bit easier to control, though slightly less natural perhaps, which is to reduce the question to the one dimensional case. So I'm gonna define what's called the covering ganality like this. So I take my manifold and any algebraic variety can be, if we were, I mean, I can find if I take a point on that variety, I can find lots of curves through that point. So what I wanna do now is I wanna take a random point and I wanna ask myself, what's the, what's the smallest ganality of a curve that I can find going through a random point? So this is the covering ganality. I wanna take the smallest, um, the smallest integer so that if I take a general point on this variety, I can find a curve of that ganality passing through the point. Okay, so let's, so again, if X is a curve, then of course I'm just back to the ganality again. So these are two different measures that reduce to the same ganality in the one dimensional case, but we'll see they measure slightly different things. So what does the degree of irrationality measure? Well, to say that the degree of irrationality is one means that we can find a degree one rational map between X and PN so that means exactly that X is rational. So the degree of irrationality exactly measures the failure of X to be rational. What about the covering ganality? Well, what would it mean for the covering ganality to be one? That means if we take a general point on our, on our manifold, on our, we can find a, a curve of ganality one passing through that point. So that would mean that we can find a curve of genus, a, a, cur a rational curve passing through a general point. And so this is another flavor of rationality in higher dimensions, it's called uniruled. So uniruled means that you can find a rational curve through each point, or what's the same thing, you can find a map from some n-dimensional variety cross P1 onto X, but it, it's, it's kind of the ruled analog of being unirational. So these are two, uh, these are two integers that reduce to the, this same one dimensional measure. And in general, uh, they may, we'll see in a second, they kind of measure different things. What, what is clear is that the covering ganality is less than or equal to this degree of irrationality. Because if we have a map of some degree from X to PN, and we look at the inverse image of a general line, well, the inverse image of a line will be a curve on X that maps delta to one onto P1. So we can find just by taking the inverse image of a general line, we can find curves of ganality at most delta through a given point. So the covering ganality is always at most the degree of irrationality. And there are lots of other uh, notions. Uh, I'm, I'm just confused about one point. So if it's uniruled by the previous definition, then yeah. you just now take the inverse image of a line, the map from that curve would typically be many no, to no, one. No, no, no. Uniruled is different. Uniruled means that there's, I mean, again, this is, that's just vocabulary. That's just words. Right. Uniruled means that you can find- Well, uniruled, I say it's not irrational. Cross uh, P1 mapping onto X. Ruled uh, would mean right. it's cross. So it's dominated by something ruled. The uni always means dominated by. I see. Yeah. I see. It's dominated by something ruled. Um, right, and there's a variant here, which is gonna come up in a minute. Remember we had this uh, business before called uh, unirational, which was something is unirational if there's a se potentially several to one map from projector space onto your X. So in the same way we can define what you might call the degree of uni irrationality, which measures, this, this measures the deviation from being unirational. So it's the least degree of rationality of something mapping onto X. Okay, so let's do some examples. Uh, so this, the, the examples, this is for better or for worse, the examples involves, always involves some sort of pleasant projective geometry. So let's see, let's see what these look like. Okay, so let's start with the degree D surface in P3. So we have a surface in P3 that's defined by a single polynomial of degree D. And I claim that the covering ganality of such a gadget is at most d minus two. So why is that? Well, you've got your surface in P3, 
and pick a point on your surface, okay? Now you can look at the embedded tangent plane to your surface at that point. So this embedded tangent plane, plane is a P2, and we can look at this P2 sits in P3, and we can consider the intersection of this P2 with this surface. Now, if you intersect this uh, surface with a plane, the surface is defined by a equation of degree D. So when you intersect this surface with a plane, you get something in the plane, a plane curve defined by an equation of degree D. So that's a degree D plane curve. But this, because it's a tangent plane, this curve, when you intersect with a tangent plane, this curve is gonna be singular. So uh, the intersection of a surface with a tangent plane is gonna be usually irreducible, a singular uh, plane curve of degree D. And that has, um, that has ganality at most D minus two, because if you project from this point, from a singular point, you get a, um, a map from this singular curve of degree D to P1 of degree D minus two. So that, uh, so for a surface in P3, it's covered by curves of ganality at most D minus two. Okay, what about the degree, degree of irrationality? Well, you can do the same thing. If you have a surface of degree D, you can do the same thing as before. You can project from a point. So you can do stereographic projection and that gives you a rational map from your surface to a complementary P2 of degree D minus one. So you can certainly always get at most D minus one, just as for plane curves. But now something different happens for surfaces than for plane curves. So for plane curves, any smooth plane curve, the best you could do was a degree D minus one map. But there are some surfaces where you can do better. Um, so I claim that if your surface contains two skew lines, two disjoint lines, then you can find a funny degree D minus two map from your surface to P2. And I've put this in small print. I don't want to go into this in too detail, but much detail, but I'll say it very quickly. If you have, take two skew lines in space <laughs> and now look at all the lines joining uh, a point on line number one to a point on line number two. So I get a, I get a two dimensional family of lines in space. Uh, namely, I get, I can take a one dimension, I can take P1 on L1, P2 on L2. I get a two dimensional family of lines in space. And those lines have the property that they, they fill space once. That if you take a, a general point in space, uh, it lies on a unique line joining a point on line one and line two. And you can see that if you just look at two lines crossing in space, they seem to cross, you see them as crossing at one point. So that means your eye lies on exactly one secant line joining line one to line two. Okay, so now if we take a point on our surface, we can uh, point a general point on our surface, we can get a map from the surface to line one and cross line two by just sending this point X to the unique point on line one and line two, uh, whose secant contains X. And this gives us a map from X to, P, to L1 cross L2. And you see the, these points don't count and these lines will meet the surface generally in D minus two other points. So this gives us a map of degree D minus two. So what's important here is just that, um, so how, how common is does this construction work? Well, once you get to surfaces of degree four or higher, um, most surfaces of degree four or higher don't contain lines. So this won't work for a random surface of degree four or higher. On the other hand, for any degree D, you can find smooth surfaces that contain two disjoint lines. So what's happening here is we're getting some kind of special behavior in all degrees, but for special surfaces. So the for, for okay. a surface of any degree, degree, for example, would have two skew lines in it, right? Good again? If you take the Fermat, equation of any, you know, sum yeah, of, yeah, uh, there, are lots of surfaces that contain, there are lots of surfaces that contain two yeah. skew lines. I mean, they have, they have co-dimension like 2D plus one or something in the set of all surfaces. Yeah, there are lots of them. There are lots of them. Um, and this incidentally is how you can show that this proves the rationality of a cubic surface. Because if you take cubic surfaces have two skew lines, so this gives you a rational parameterization of a cubic surface. Okay, what's the story about hypersurfaces? So, uh, I want to go, so the story here is we go back to these holomorphic end forms. And the claim is that the, pos, the, the, this, the, 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 the this degrees of irrationality for these surfaces, for these hypersurfaces is governed somehow by the positivity of these end forms. Uh, 
but not the number somehow how many points they separate. So let me sort of state a theorem and then I'll show you sort of what the, what the idea is. Okay, so the theorem here, so I'll mention it has a slightly complicated history. So let's take a smooth surface of degree D and PN. And then the claim is uh, that the covering denality is always at least D minus N. So this in for surfaces in, uh, in P3, that's dimension two. So we've seen that it has covering denality at most D minus two. So it has covering denality exactly D minus two. So the covering denality of the hypersurfaces of dimension N is at least D minus N. And uh, now what about the degree of irrationality? So here we have to be a little more careful what we say, because we've seen that you can sometimes for some special surfaces and same thing for hypersurfaces, you can get exceptional behavior. So the claim is that we want to give an, an, we want to say that if you have a very general surface, then the degree of irrationality is D minus one. And the only thing you can do is this projection from a point. Now, what does it mean when you talk about a very general hypersurface? Well, a hypersurface, it's defined by one polynomial. And so the coordinates of that, you can coordinatize all hypersurfaces by just using the, the coefficients of the monomials in your hyper defining equation as coordinates. And so the claim, when you talk about a general or a very general surface or hypersurface, you mean all hypersurfaces whose, whose coefficients um, are required to lie away from potentially countably many subvarieties. So there's some crazy equation in the bunch of equations in the coordinates of a hypersurface that tell you that it contains two skew lines. And you want to kind of throw all those things away. So if you take a random hypersurface, um, it should have, it will have degree of irrationality D minus one. So let's see, this is Bastianelli, Cortini, and Depori. They had kind of set the thing up and they had done it in two dimensions and conjectured the same thing in higher dimensions. And this is Bastianelli, Depori, Lawrence Ein, myself, and Brooke Ullery. We sort of saw how to, to finish, their, finish the argument. So let me quickly run through the idea and then I'll, I'll go on to other things. So there's a, this is the, the idea is this, and I wanna explain why this positivity of these end forms comes up. So imagine that you have a, 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 a rational you have a, a rational covering of PN of relatively small degree. And I take, pick, take a random point in PN and I look at its fiber. So in this example, my fiber, I would look at the, my point in PN is a point on this line and I would look at the D minus two intersections of this line other than with this surface other than P1 and P2. Okay, now the idea is um, that there's a Mumford, there's a trace map that you can define whenever you have a finite, a, generic, a generically finite covering of varieties. So I claim that there's a trace map. So we have this covering between um, X and PN. And I claim that there's a trace map that takes N zero forms on X to N zero forms on PN. And roughly speaking, what do you do? Well, if you have an N zero form on PN, you average it over the fibers and that should give you an N zero form on PN. Now, of course, that's, uh, that's a little bit tricky because the map isn't defined everywhere. It might ramify. So uh, you have to be a little bit careful, but there is such a map and Mumford constructed it a long time ago. But on the other hand, so we have a trace map like this that basically averages the form along the fibers, but we also know that P PN itself doesn't carry any N zero forms. So what that means is that if we have an N zero form on X, it has to trace to zero along a fiber. And this gives us some kind of obstruct, this gives us some kind of obstruction to the geometry of the fiber. So for example, if you have an N zero form on X and it vanishes at all but one point of the fiber, well, then it's got to vanish at the remaining point. Otherwise they couldn't average to zero. So the, every time you have a holomorphic form, it puts some kind of funny conditions on the fiber. And if you look at what they say in this case, using the fact that you know what the N zero forms on X, it turns out to mean that if you're in project, this X lives in projective space, these fibers actually have to lie on the line. And now you move the line in over a rational curve and it turns out that you can then sweep out on X a curve on, you can sweep out a, a curve on X of ganality at most N. Okay, but so then the question is, if you have a very general hypersurface, can it have curves of bounded ganality? And a long time ago, people started looking pretty hard at what kind of things could exist on, curves can exist on hypersurfaces, and it turns out 
that you can't have um, any curves with small denominators. So that completes it. What else can you do going further? Well, you could ask actually, what's the covering denality? So we just said that it's at most D minus uh, N, but if you sort of look harder at this argument and you do some very pleasant local geometry, you can do better. So this is uh, Bastianelli, Chiliberto, Flamino, and Stupino. Uh, it, it turns out that the covering denality for a very general hypersurface is on the order of D minus the square root of N. So that's another thing. Another thing you can do is you can ask about this degree of unirationality. So now we come to one of our Stony Brook participants. So this is this was Riji Yang, who maybe you heard him talk earlier. This was his warm-up problem. So he showed that with X is above, um, you could in fact get bound, they, they get the same bound for this degree of unirationality. So not only does X not admit a low degree, can you this is the lowest degree covering from X to anything, but you can't do better by mapping on to X. Okay, let me quickly talk about complete intersections. So there's a general principle um, that if you, um, if you any, any theorem for hypersurfaces typically extends to complete intersections. So what's a complete intersection? So what you do is you look at an n-dimensional variety that's the transversal intersection of a certain number of hypersurfaces. So I'm gonna take E hypersurfaces in PN plus E of some degrees. So most varieties are not complete intersections, but they, they, you know, there are a lot of them and they tend to behave rather like hypersurfaces. So you could ask yourself, well, what's the, what's the degree of irrationality for one of or the covering denality for one of these high, complete intersections? And if you use the same kind of argument as before, you easily get bounds that are kind of additive in the degrees. On the other hand, it's known, I noticed a long time ago that you can use Bogomolov's theorem for vector bundles on surfaces to, if you have a curve to say that the genality is bounded by some expression that's multiplicative in the degrees. And so a natural question, which turns, just seems not to be, it's, it's harder than you would think, um, is you'd like to say that these complete intersection also have uh, measures of irrationality that are bounded multiplicatively. And so here we come, this is the the one of the thesis problems of Nathan Chen. So he, at least in a qualitative sense, handled the case of co-dimension two complete intersections. So you take a co-dimension two uh, complete intersection in projective space, and then if the defining degrees are large enough, the covering denality, and hence the, um, hence the, uh, the degree of irrationality grows like D1 times D2. And this involves some very pleasant geometry of what curves are on the surfaces, on the hypersurface and, and using some vanishing theorems and so on. So that's a nice story. But now I wanted this is to go to talk about what I think is the most interesting, uh, probably the most interesting result in this area. So these are hypersurfaces in the Fano range. So remember in this range where you have a hypersurface of low degree, this is the range where all these rationality questions become very, become very subtle. And um, so, but there's this wonderful theorem of Kalar from the mid seventies who used a uh, reduction to characteristic P to show that if you take a very general hypersurface of degree, roughly two thirds the dimension, it's irrational. And so what Nathan Chen and David Stapleton, an ex student did is they uh, saw how to adapt Kalar's characteristic P argument to control the degree of irrationality. So the statement is you fix this, this number E minus, which is N plus two minus D. And then as, as the dimension gets very large, the degree of irrationality goes at least like the square root of N. So in particular, I mean, by Collard it was known that these surfaces are irrational, these hypersurfaces are irrational, but this is saying that their degree of irrationality goes to infinity, which was uh, completely unknown. So what's the idea? I'm going to be very vague here. So this is in small print. So, so what, how do you, I mean, what was Kalar's idea? Why does characteristic P have anything to do with these rationality of complex hypersurfaces? Well, what Kalar noticed is this, that you take, again, always the obstruction to rationality is differential forms. And in this degree, if you're working in characteristic zero, your hypersurfaces don't carry any non-zero forms. But, we're but not differential forms do funny things in characteristic P. And what Kalar noticed is you can find the limit of hypersurface in the limit of hypersurfaces of degree D in positive characteristic that do carry some non-zero differential forms. So this is one of these funny 
uh, characteristic p tricks. Now that means that they're not rational, but they're also not ruled. That implies that they're not they're by rational to something p1 cross something. Now, the second thing that Kalar noticed or used is that while rationality the, behaves very, it's hard to understand how it behaves in families uh, for this being ruled behaves much better. So in character, uh, a limit of ruled varieties is ruled. That's an old theorem of Nagata. So Kalar's idea is he produces these, these hypersurfaces that aren't ruled and positive characteristic. And then you lift to characteristic zero and you think of this characteristic P thing as a limit of the, of the characteristic zero thing. And since the characteristic P thing isn't ruled, your characteristic zero thing can't be ruled. And so it's not, it's not rational. So what uh, Chen and Stapleton did is they, uh, they, they generalized this to higher dimensions. So what they, uh, to, to, to these degrees of irrationality. So they showed that Kolar's hypersurfaces don't admit low degree covers to ruled varieties by looking at the positivity of the differential forms he used. And then they showed the analogous, the analog of this specialization result for ruled varieties. So that to my mind is the most interesting, uh, one of the most interesting theorems. Okay, let me now turn to another class of varieties. So these are flat varieties. So uh, again, the interesting questions in this thing is, oh, in this story is also, is always when you don't have a lot of differential forms to play with. So another example of varieties that don't have many differential forms are complex tori. So they have some, but they're, they're kind of constant. So I wanna let, I wanna look at the case where A is a complex torus of dimension N. And I want it to be a complex torus that admits an embedding in projective space. So that's called an abelian variety. So what is this A? So I'm going to start with Cn. And this lambda is going to be a free abelian group of rank 2n and Cn. So it's basically a copy of z to the 2n sitting inside c to the n. But there are lots of different ways that z to the 2n can sit in c to the n. And there's some condition on this lattice, a well understood condition that says you can use theta functions to embed this thing in projective space. And that's called an abelian variety. Okay, so we wanna take an abelian variety of dimension N and it of course has a one, it has a unique N zero form, namely just the constant N zero form. Um, so it's certainly irrational, but again, we wanna understand sort of how irrational is this? Now the degree of irrationality is, is very mysterious, but so the simpler question is to look at what ganality of curves we can use to cover this A. Okay, so what can we say about the covering ganality of one of these abelian varieties? And that's the same thing as the least ganality of any one curve on A, because once you have one curve, you can translate it around to, to cover. Okay. Well, you can't expect an answer that just depends on the dimension, because if you take any Riemann surface, it always, of genus N, it sits in the abelian variety of dimension N, namely it's Jacobian. So in any dimension, you can find uh, abelian varieties that contain these curves that are two to one covers of PN. So the question is, what can you say about the covering ganality for a general abelian variety? And again, general means we take this lattice fairly generally, very generally. And so there was a sporadic result uh, from the 1990s, but then when these questions of, um, of degrees of irrationality came up a few years ago, Claire Voisin sort of went back and she saw that you could use the cover, you could uh, generalize this, this sporadic result in dimension uh, for dimension four to n dimensions. So what she showed is that if you take a very general abelian variety of dimension n, so you take Cn mod, a very general lattice, whatever that means, then you can't find any curve. The smallest ganality of a curve on it has to grow logarithmically in the dimension. And she conjectured that, in fact, there should be a linear bound. And that was uh, then shortly thereafter proven by Olivier Martin, who was at the time, this was his thesis problem at Chicago. Now he's a postdoc here. So he proved this conjecture of Claire Voisin that if you have an endom very general n-dimensional abelian variety, the least degree, the least canality of a curve on it is roughly n over two. So what's the idea there? So this, again, I get to explain another kind of very interesting idea in algebraic geometry, which is called Chow groups. So this is a very, this is a funny thing that uh, 
And Claire Voisin was really the first person to sort of understand how child groups were very important in these questions of rationality. So for any variety, in this case, an abelian variety, her idea is to study what's called the group chow zero of A. So that's the group of zero cycles on A mod rational equivalents. So what does that mean? So a zero cycle on anything is just a formal sum of points. So you just take a formal sum of integer linear combination of points. And then we're gonna put some homology-like relation on these, uh, on these zero cycles. And that goes like this. So we're gonna say that very roughly speaking, two zero cycles, two linear, so they are two uh, zero cycles are rationally equivalent if we can find a one dimensional cycle on this variety A cross P1 so that these two zero cycles are the fibers of it. So here is my, here's a copy of A, vertically I've drawn A and I've drawn two zero cycles on A. And then I have some formal linear combination of curves on A cross P1 and I intersect that curve with the fiber over zero. I intersect that curve with the fiber over infinity. I get two different zero cycles on A and that defines the notion of rational equivalence. Now this looks kind of pretty tame, right? Because it, you, it's the same kind of picture you draw for you know, one or two zero cycles on a topological space homologous. But the idea is that there are not that many rational curves on a variety. So this turns out to be a very complicated and slightly wild equivalence relation. And in fact, Mumford showed in, um, in the late 60s that this is such a complicated equivalence relation that this chow zero of A is not finite dimensional. So I'm not gonna exactly say what that means, but essentially it means that you can't, it's not parameter, this, this group of Zero cycles mod rational equivalence is so complicated that you can't, it's not parameterized by the points of an algebraic variety. So it's a very complicated gadget. But what Claire Voisin realized is that it has a lot to say about rationality. In this case, it will say a lot about degrees of irrationality. So how does this go? So this is some complicated group that doesn't have any clear geometric structure. But nonetheless, there's a map from the k symmetric product of A. So that's just A cross A cross A, k times modulo the symmetric group. So that just is a variety that parameterizes unordered k tuples of points on A. And you can just take k points and you can consider, add them all up and you get a, a Chow class. So this is a map from an algebraic variety to some group. And, it's, but, and it, it doesn't have, what, what is true by general principles is that any fiber of this thing is a countable union of, of sub varieties of sim A. So it doesn't behave like a morphism of varieties, but it's not completely random. So if you fix uh, the fibers of this map are countable unions of varieties. And um, the, the next observation is if you have any curve that admits a low degree covering to P1, well, if C admits a low degree covering of P1, then you get this one dimensional family of zero cycles on C of degree at most k that are all rationally equivalent because they're all the fibers of a map to P1. And so uh, you get this uh, one dimensional family of zero cycles on C that are all rationally equivalent. And so then you push them to A. And so you get a one dimensional family of cycles on k cycles on A that are all rationally equivalent. So the observation is that if this abelian variety uh, has a curve on it of ganality less than or equal to k, you've got at least one fiber of this map, one one dimensional, one curve in here that maps to a point in this funny group. Okay, so what's the idea? So what Voisin and Martin prove essentially very vaguely is that they prove that the fibers of this map, if you, if you let K get small, if, if you let the dimension get small, dimension get large compared to K, they prove that all the fibers of this map are countable. So they're, 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 you don't have any positive dimensional stuff. You just have countable unions of points. And of course, once you know that by this remark that says uh, you can't find any curves of small ganality. So again, I'm, this, is, this is fine print here. I'm not, I mean, the proof is quite involved, but the idea is uh, you show that for some value of n, n naught, and a very general abelian variety of that dimension, you can bound the dimension of the fibers. And then given a larger dimensional abelian variety, you degenerate it, you specialize it to something of the form, an n-dimensional abelian variety where E and a one-dimensional abelian variety, and you show that then 
um, the dimension of the fibers of this map decreases. So you start with a finite thing. When the get dimension gets bigger, you can go down to n0 minus 1 and so on. So eventually, uh, you'll get down to the point where, for a very general A, the fibers uh, become countable. And so that bounds this covering analogy. OK, but I don't think it's. I don't think that people necessarily expect that this is kind of the right answer. And so it's an interesting question, what's the, what's the right growth of the covering anomaly? Uh, another question that I think I, people have no idea on is how do you expect this degree of, irrational, of irrationality to grow with n? Now here you have to, I'm cheating a little bit. You can't really talk about families of A. You need to fix some discrete invariance of the lattice. And then you would expect this degree of irrationality to go to infinity with the dimension and also the invariance of this lattice. Now, the one case where this is uh, known, again, this is some local work, is in dimension two. So in dimension two, it turns out that the, you can see that the, any Boolean surface carries hyperelliptic curves. And I had always imagined that when you look at this covering analogy, that should go to infinity with this invariant of the lattice. But um, this was Nathan Chen's warm up problem and then strengthened by Olivier Martin. In fact, it turns out, surprisingly, that for Boolean surfaces, you can, they always admit degree, degree maps, degree four maps to P2. And in general, uh, what Martin showed, that equality holds in most cases. So this is a special fact about what are called Kummer surfaces. You look at um, these are special surfaces in P4 and P3 that are quotients that you can embed A mod multiplication by minus one in P4. This is a P3, it's a classical story. But again, in higher dimension, this is kind of an interesting open question. So let me end. I'm, I'm going to end a minute or two early. I think there are a whole bunch of um, open questions here um, that are interesting. So I'll end by uh, stating two open questions that I like. So the first open question, which was suggested by Ron Denagi, is what can, you, can you, what can you say about measures of irrationality for various moduli spaces? OK, so what does that mean? So one of the really important ideas in algebraic geometry is that interesting algebra geometric objects are parameterized by the points of some new algebraic variety. So for example, NG, which is probably one of the most famous spaces in all of mathematics, this is called the moduli space of curves of genus G. So it's a variety. It has dimension 3G minus 3. And its points correspond in some very natural way to isomorphism classes of compact Riemann surfaces of genus G. So all Riemann surfaces of genus G are parameterized by the points of a space of dimension 3G minus 3. And similarly, there's a moduli space called AG. Um, which parameterizes isomorphism classes of g-dimensional abelian varieties. I should maybe call them AN, but somehow you always call them AG when you talk about moduli space. G-dimensional abelian varieties, and you need to, again, you need to fix some discrete measures, some discrete invariants of the lattice. But then you, uh, you get a moduli space of dimension, uh, I think it's g plus 1 choose 2, essentially g squared over 2. So these are very basic spaces, and you can ask, are they rational, are they irrational? And in the 70s and early 80s, this was a, this was a big problem. And one of, the, one of Mumford's greatest theorem, Harris and Mumford in the early 80s, one of the amazing theorems was that he, they showed that the moduli space, if the genus G is large, the moduli space of curves of genus G is irrational. So that's completely, it goes completely against the classical intuition. When you look at small genus examples, they turn out to be rational. But the, it turns out that for large genus, these spaces become quite complicated. OK, so you could ask, what can you say about measures of irrationality? Now, for this moduli space of genus G, so I think uh, Sam Grusheski has been looking at this question within some analogs of this with Nathan Chen and others. This is analogous to the question that Abramovich asked, looked at from the sort of one dimensional case. The moduli space of uh, abelian varieties of genus G has a group theoretic meaning. And so you could hope to attack, attack it by modular, by you know, modular forms. But the moduli space of curves of genus G, it's unlikely since it's such a big theorem that it's actually irrational, it's unlikely that you'd get um, it would be you'd get reasonable lower bounds. That seems out of reach. But what you might expect is upper bounds. 
So, but I'm asking, so can you find an example? Can you, can you, um, can you find an upper bound on the, let's say the covering banality of the moduli space of curves of genus G? So what is that really asking very concretely? If I give you a random curve of genus G, you want to realize it as the as a as I put it in a one-dimensional family of curves. You want to realize it as a fiber of a map from a surface to some other curve, and you want to say that the the base curve can't have. You can do that with a relatively small ganality base curve. So there's some simple thing, some kind of silly thing that comes out of Hurwitz theory, but this is some huge number that kind of grows doubly exponentially. But it's in principle you should be able to do much better. So in principle, I could imagine that there's some nice geometric construction that lets you give upper bounds for this uh, covering analogy. And then the last question, which is one of my favorites, which is again, kind of annoyingly, it seems annoyingly so far people, I mean, a number of people have thought about it and so far I don't think it's gotten off the ground. Um, so abelian surfaces, there are two classes of algebraic surfaces that uh, kind of are flat that have first term class, trivial first term class. So one are these abelian surfaces, which are covered here, and the other are these K3 surfaces. So K3 surfaces are basically they're two-dimensional Calabi Yao manifolds. So these are the, if you want to use more big words, these are the, the surfaces of um, hyperkähler surfaces. And so algebraic K3 surfaces come in, in families. There's a, there's a discrete parameter um, if you look at the algebraic one. So basically a K3 surface, you can take a hyperplane section of it and you get a curve of genus D, let's say. And so there's a parameter attached to these K3 surfaces, which is the genus of one of these hyperplane sections. And then you would expect that this degree of, they, the, all these K3 surfaces have covering ganality too. That's an old theorem of Mumford and Bogomolov. But what you'd expect is that their degree of irrationality should go to infinity with G. But so far that's, uh, I, I mean, I don't think that that's not known. So that's another question. Anyway, uh, I'm gonna stop there and I'm, uh, thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to, to see if I can answer them. Thank you. Questions, comments? I think there's a question on the chat. Okay, I don't see the chat. So can somebody? I turned off my chat. I don't, okay. I'm not sure I, can, I know how to. Turn I can it read off. it to you. Okay. When you, this is from Raphael. Oh, okay. So when you think of a lattice, do you consider it as a finite topological space or as a group? If you're thinking of a lattice in terms of group theory, what happens ah. if you mod out by another regular tiling? Does that give you another yeah. projective variety? Well, so I need to, yeah, so I need to look at if, so these abelian varieties are CN mod. So you need to have a subgroup in there. I mean, you want to mod out by something that's a group. So you think of it as a, so you think of it as a copy of, so it's like C mod Z squared. You think of it as a group. But the point is you get, um, you get an interesting thing because like, let's, let's do the one dimensional case. There are lots of different ways of putting Z2 in C, you can take just the points with integer coordinates, but you can then, you can tilt the lattice a little bit. And so there are different embeddings of Z2 into C, and although the, and the quotient is always topologically a torus, but it turns out that the complex structure of the quotient depends on the particular lattice you take. And so in this way, you get lots of different, this is this, is, this, is this famous moduli space of the brilliant variety. So there, you get different, if you change the lattice, the, the abelian variety you get is topologically always the same, but they have different complex structure. And um, lattice, it's not it, it's not a variety, right? It's only that's the weird thing that they're <laughs> you choose a completely a general lattice in in yes, yes. You two, that you get something that's not can't be embedded in projective space. Yeah, right. So right. So yeah, in higher dimensions, the, the general complex torus is a is a is a barren and in and it's a very barren <laughs> object. It doesn't contain, it doesn't have any meromorphic functions and it doesn't have any sub varieties. But there's some well understood, it goes back to Riemann, there's some well understood condition on the lattice that, um, that says that you get, you get an algebraic variety. So you need to, I don't know if you know what theta functions are, you, you embed the brilliant varieties by these theta functions and you need some funny, you know, the lattice should basically be, you take the unit vectors and then 
that gives you z to the z to the g, and then the other g is the you should get a col the columns you should get a g by g matrix whose imaginary part is positive definite and it's symmetric, and that turns out to be the condition. So this is this whole anyway that's well understood. And then before you can really talk about families, you need to fix some you need to fix some discrete invariants of the lattice. Otherwise, these don't vary, and you know you don't get Hausdorff families. So you need to there's a little something you need to do there, right? But I mean, the, the basic, right. So, but basically you're looking at, at C to the G mod Z to the two G, but there are a lot of interesting ways. There are a lot of different ways to put Z to the two G and C to the G. That's not how, what's being, what I'm saying there. Yeah, Am I right? Uh, 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 may I ask you a question? Uh, sure. Could you please, uh, could you please give the reference uh, about uh, uh, the discovery of the relation between child groups and uh, the rationality by Clark Wallen? Oh, um, she has, I mean, it's, this is a big, it's, I mean, it's a big story. So for example, she has some, she gave some bio lectures at Princeton at the Institute a few years ago, and she has a book in the, a volume in the RM series, the Princeton, the Annals Lecture Notes. So I think that would contain the references. I mean, it's, um, this is a, it's a huge, I mean, it's really a big, a big story. So I, I would look at something like that as secondary source and then that'll work for you. So I forget what it's called, but she has, I, I can't see it from over here. She has, there's a, maybe four or five years ago, she has a volume in the, the vial lectures at Princeton in the, in the Orange Annals series. And I'm sure she, I'm sure she gives references there. She doesn't and really talk about rationality in that, in that book. She doesn't? No. So we, what's it for us? I mean, um, I think the first, I think the first place, place it came up is actually Pirola and uh, Alzati Pirola. That was really the, they were the first to talk about this. No, but the rational, I mean, but you know, this, 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 you know, universally trivial child zero thing. She doesn't talk about that. No, in... not at all. It's, it's only in her paper. Okay. So that's an Invencionist paper. What is it called? Like co-dimension? I don't know. Um, ah, you're talking about something else, I think. It's, I'm, I'm not talking about, her... about measures of irrationality. I'm talking about the thing about, you know, the, the, all this work on, you know, these universally child, child trivial you know, the stuff that then Bert Totaro generalized and so on. I, that's not in ah, her. Ah, ah, yeah, yeah, that's in her orange that's bone. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah. Uh, groups of nationality, which is something yeah, she's yeah, been okay. working for a while. I think that must be in her bio lectures. Yeah, this it thing is. About, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Yeah, this thing here, the theorem that this is a, where is the paper? So the, this is all of you. Where, I'm, so yeah, this is not in that, but this is, I don't remember where it is. But her, it's in Henri Le Beg Institute. Ah, okay, but she's been thinking a lot about you know connections between Chow groups and you know she 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 proved these very interesting non rationality results by studying these these Chow groups. Um, and that must okay, be don't have them in her bio lectures, aren't they, Olivier? Yeah, that's in her her, her orange book is is, is quite yeah, good. Yeah, so. Yeah. I would... <laughs> So if you, you, you looked at the uh, Fano case and you also discussed kind of Kalabi Yao types, but if you go yeah. to, so in, in surfaces, there's not gonna be anything interesting for elliptic surfaces because you already know the ganality is two, right? And just, just, you've got all of these elliptic curves. Yeah. But if it's for a general type, is, is there, are there any good results? Well, the thing is, so, you know, the, the sh I mean, I don't know what it is. So the, the shape of the results is you want to see, you want some kind of invariant of the surface, you know, like for surfaces in P3, you want the degree or something. I mean, so I don't, you know, I don't know what would be a, a non-tautological statement for surfaces. Of, I mean, you want to say that somehow as they become numerically more complicated, their uh, you know, degrees of irrationality goes up, but I don't know what a measure would be. I mean, I don't think there's anything just in terms of you know, PG or anything like that. So I don't, there aren't results, but I, the thing is what I'm trying to say is I don't know what a statement could right. be. Right. And, and what about higher dimensions? So for example, Kalabi uh, threefold, maybe the quintic hypersurface is, 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 it, is are, has anyone looked at this? 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know. So one thing that people have done, and I forget who did it, is that you can look at, um, um, you can start looking at like, what was it? I just saw it the other day. Was it moduli of, um, hmm, moduli of hyperkähler things at K3? I, I forget, but I mean, you can look at other, I mean, yeah, I don't know what people have done. I don't know, right? So uh, let, me, uh, let me not try to answer that. I mean, even for quintic hypersurfaces, if you look at super high dimensional, it's not even known if they're rational, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of. Oh, I thought we were talking about. <laughs> oh, no, I, but I was taking the example where it would be Kalabi, yeah, right? So. Oh, I see. So, yeah. But, yeah, I don't, I, again, I don't, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know either. Well, thanks. That was a very in interesting talk. And it's nice to see that our students have been doing good things. Yeah. I hope good. that well, thank the, you. the visiting students will find that encouraging. <laughs>